Theology of the Body and How to Live It Out. Anybody read, by the way, any of the original text? Maybe a little? A lot? Okay. There's a new <coughs> translation, which has been out a couple of years. It's uh, by Mikhail Waldstein, the translator. It is outstanding, and it gives us a real opportunity now to uh, appropriate the object of the body, even though the audience talks are now 25 plus years old. But this is, it's a very important time to reappropriate. Okay, so basic question here is, you know, what are our bodies for? You know, can, the idea of a theo theology of the body is a, a fairly new thought to have. You know, why do, how can we theologize about the body? There's a number of possible answers for what our bodies are for. Um, maybe you could add to the list. Um, so, you know, our bodies are just about pleasure. Our bodies are basically a hindrance. That's, you know, a fairly old philosophical idea. Our bodies get in the way of our souls. Um, our bodies are really nothing at all. They're an illusion. They're, um, they don't have any meaning. And uh, the general tendency to separate the body and the soul, this dualism, is very strong in our culture, even though it's a body, supposedly a body celebrating culture. And we'll see that, in fact, despite the, all the talk about sex and bodiliness, that this is a deeply uh, cynical stance towards the human body, and that what John Paul presents yeah. instead is the true beauty and meaning of the human body. Okay, so this is another alternative, which is that our bodies are really for self-gift, which um, you can imagine is closer to what the folks can um, all right, so let's think about a little bit. When you think about what our bodies are for, let's think about how it is we love. You know, you think of the, if you watch a cartoon, you can always tell if a cartoon character is in love, right? Because hearts appear and cupids fly around. You know, but in real life, right, that doesn't happen. Love is something that's invisible. Um, there's anybody read the end of the affair? Very good. The movie doesn't count. Oh, it's great. Horrible. It's great. Like two minutes <laughs> the way through, and then all of a sudden it goes all wrong. So at the, the point the, where it matters. By yeah. The way. yeah. <laughs> But the book is really good, so I highly recommend it. So you have this woman, Sarah, in the end of the affair, and she has been in this long-term affair, right? No, no surprise there. Um, and she's deciding she wants to end it. She wants to live chastely, and she's finding this difficult. <laughs> um, and she, as she gets through the, she gets to the certain point, she's like, you know, I just wish I didn't have a body. She kind of goes through that phase that we talked about where her body's a hindrance. She wants it to be nothing at all. Um, and she has this thought. She contemplates the, the man that she loves, Morris, and she says, you know, she thinks that he has a scar on his shoulder. And she remembers that he, she found out that he got the scar from protecting somebody when a wall is about to fall on him. Um, and she realizes that she wants that scar to exist forever. She, you know, her body, she might want to be nothing, but she doesn't want his body to be nothing. And then there's this, she has this insight. She said, I began to want my body that I hated, but only because it could love that scar. We can love with our minds, but can we love only with our minds? You know, if we were all brains in a vat, right, bodies wouldn't make a difference, but we're more than just brains in a vat, and this is how we love. This is the deeply Christian view of our embodiment, how precious it is. Even though there is a tendency in, and here I speak as a theologian and I, and I criticize um, my fellow theologians, and I'm afraid I have many opportunities to do so, uh, there has long been a temptation among theologians to go towards a dualism, this Neoplatonic tradition where the body is merely an instrument of the soul. And um, I think you get a sense of this even in the catechetical instruction, such as it is that we have right now, uh, where, let me ask you, what is heaven like? And somebody say, what, what do you think of when you think of heaven? Somebody throw something. Yes. I think a couple of us have been reading Dante and uh -huh. had a picture of the rose around um, the beatific vision. Well, you got it right. Quiet. <laughs> 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 Now, what's wrong with that picture? And this is 
what we're going to really unfold here. We lose our bodies. That's right. It, as angel, an angel does not have a body. But what our happiness must consist in to be perfect, it must involve the resurrection of the body. And this is something St. Augustine, for instance, would say in, in dealing with that basic question of philosophy, how do we live a good life? How do we become happy? He, he, he makes the point, in the end, you, want, you need your body to be happy. And only God can do that in the resurrection of the body. But I guarantee you, even though we confess the resurrection of the flesh, it is not something that is sunk very deeply in our consciousness. Now, part of that is because of, of a, an old tradition of a Neoplatonizing theology, but there's also this general dualism, the split between body and soul that is just there from Descartes on in modern thought. Okay, so into this we get the theology of the body. Very impressed kind of guys. Usually there's the center spaces in the middle and everybody's in the outside. So this, these are about 129 audience talks delivered very early in John Paul II's pontificate, so 1979 to 1984. So if you think about it, just about everything that you read by JP2 was written after or during these audience talks. So it's, it's very much part of this whole pontificate. And he's going to explore now the theological meaning of the body, not something that had really been done. Okay, so. There's a classic understanding about um, the body, which is very helpful. Um, and this is a, um, a Frenchman, so he sounds French. <laughs> the, the soul has need of the body in order one day to tell its secret, the soul's secret, like the rose that opens its pages to the breeze and can be read with closed eyes. So the soul needs the body to reveal itself. And this is a, a very poetic way of saying basically that the soul is the form of the body. Um, the soul forms its body and keeps it alive. There, there was one thing that I, I really um, loved, and you might remember around the time of, of Terry Scheib, a lot of people were talking about um, you know, whether or not this woman has, whether, whether or not there's, really, there's any person there. Um, and prescinding from the whole question of whether or not she's really in a coma and so forth, um, somebody wrote a really great article in the Wall Street Journal, one of all places, where he said, you know, if she's alive, nobody's saying she's dead. If she's alive, she has a soul, by definition. <laughs> That death means the soul leaves. That's what death is. So if she's alive, there's a soul. Even if you know we don't like you know what she looks like. Um, so death is when the soul leaves the body. That's what the soul is is doing there. One of the things the soul is doing. Okay, so that's sort of the classic understanding. And that's part of this is because it's a complicated picture. Our soul is spiritual. It's immortal. Whereas uh, in the in the classic understanding, and it's classic because it is basic that. Any organizational principle of matter where you have a living substance, uh, where you've got nutrients being uh, assimilated by that thing, and uh, growth and uh, development are occurring, well, that's the principle explaining that is the soul. So, in fact, there are plant souls and animal souls. Tomato plant souls, cat souls. Uh, which, anytime there's life, there's a soul, an organizational principle. Our organizational principle also is, though, the seat of our knowing and loving. It's spiritual. It's not intrinsically actually conditioned by the thing that it informs the body. So, unlike my cat, which has, you know, my cat has a feline soul, keeps him alive, you know. My cat kind of has a vague, you know, sense of the world. It's not very smart, even for cats. <laughs> <It's an exercise>. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he has a lot of desires, right? But he doesn't really know and love. He doesn't really have a rational soul the way we do. So that makes our soul special. So in Christianity, you get some special reflections on soul and body. So this is a quote from the Theology of the Body. Through the fact that the word of God became flesh, the body entered theology <laughs> through the main door. So all of a sudden, we really have to grapple. Because only with Christianity do you really have God becoming flesh. You, you know, Zeus decides to become an ox and do all these silly things. Right? But that's not really, you know, it's, it's all kind of an illusion, right? But in, in Christianity, for the first time, you have this phenomenon where God becomes flesh. So incarnation, the word was made flesh. And you get this idea, of course, first in Judaism, and then deep into Christianity, the Imago Dei, so from Genesis 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over my cat, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. 
So you, Imago Dei, the image of God. So not only do we have a soul and body, but we're actually created in the image of God. And we get from Genesis the idea that this is somehow connected to being male and female, which is interesting because male and female has fundamentally to do with the body, and, and we're going to see about that. But So how do people make sense of this? How is it that we're in God's image? And you know, Genesis doesn't kind of give us a theological treatise there. The Imago is in us twofold. There is an individual aspect and a communal. And the individual aspect is the one that theologians have worked on most um, carefully. The imago is found in every single individual of the human species. That is, once you have an individual of the human species, and by all the best scientific and philosophical reasoning that happens at conception, um, you have a human person. That is, a per a, a an individual capable of knowing and loving, not just a what, not just a human thing, but a who, someone who can know and love, um, who is in fact present to him or herself, um, though is not able to actuate that until there's a sufficient development of the body. Traditionally, the body has not made much of a place, uh, has not had much of a place in the Imago because God doesn't have a body. It's a very uh, basic point, it's an important one. It's partly because we have a tendency to think about divine things according to picture thinking, and that's something that uh, Christian theology worked very hard to try to, uh, this intellectual conversion that St. Augustine, for instance, goes through in, in the Confessions, that we need to make sure that we're not thinking about God as this very diffuse uh, spiritual matter, like the Manichaeans, that it's very important to make clear that God is simply spirit. Um, so therefore, the Imago, strictly speaking, is going to have to be a spiritual reality in us. But, that there's still going to be a place for understanding the body as having a role in the Samago. And you see this at Vatican II, that, and you see this in the Catechism too, that the emphasis has shifted from, shifted. I mean, it all depends on the fact that we do have the Samago in each of us, that we have the powers of knowing and loving. This is what images the fact that God's uh, inner life, it, there are two persons that proceed from the Father, um, in according to the procession of knowing and according to the procession of loving. And that's a strict analogy. Uh, but we do know from that when we engage the modern world, we have to be ever more cognizant of the fact that we are we have a social mission. The fact that this is so is laid upon us in fact by Christianity, that the world cares about solidarity or says it does, that the world cares about human dignity or says it does. This is all actually from Christianity. Um, but the world having taken this away from the Christian atmosphere that it grew up in has now inverted a lot of these notions and we get the culture of death where in fact we talk about human rights but we apply that to the killing of the most powerless human beings. So it's this grave, grave contradiction. And so what Vatican II calls us to is to evangelize this modern world and to recover the Christian uh, truth of these concepts that the world employs. Okay, so in um, this Carl Waitia who became <laughs> which is why we care. <laughs> Sources of renewal. He, this is um, around the time of that, shortly after Vatican II. Man resembles God not only because of the spiritual nature in his immortal soul. You hear, see spiritual nature in the immortal soul, think knowing and loving, okay, which classically has always been understood very well, but also by the reason of his social nature. If by this we understand the fact that, and here comes one of the most important passages from, Gap, from um, Second Vatican Council for John Paul II, that he cannot fully realize himself except in an act of pure self-giving. From Gaudium and Spes 24. And this becomes this golden thread that weaves its way through the theology of the body. Um, and if you ever want to really understand what theology of the body is all about, it's that passage from Vatican II, Gaudium and Spes 24, that the Pope's really um, drawing on. Gaudium and Spes is the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. So one of the um, four constitutions of the Second Vatican Council, so one of the most authoritative documents of the Council. And that passage, uh, 24, is the root of John Paul's theology of the body. Okay, 
So what are we trying to do? Trying to recognize a role for the body in this understanding of the image of God, the social aspect. Um, and so this meditation that man is also a social and political animal, which even Aristotle got, right? You know, that we're not just meant to kind of live out as savages out in the woods, but that we're meant to come together in community, in families. So what we want to propose here is that the theology of the body is actually a way of understanding at a more profound level what Aristotle does get very clear um, our social nature. And you get this in Deus Caritas Est, which is? Who wrote Deus Caritas Est? Pope Bennett. Bennett. Good. So the very first encyclical. Um, so you really have two parts. And people are like, why are these two parts? They don't hold together. And, and you, that's, you only say that if you haven't understood what John Paul II was doing. You get a reflection on love, which draws very heavily on the theology of the body in part one, leading to Catholic social doctrine in part two. So the two really go hand in hand. And so basically, what are we talking about then? That the popes are trying to make us understand what does love require for us in the midst of a culture of death. Yeah, that's you know, what, what I do with my body is not my own private matter, but it has to do with justice in the world. It has to do with how the world flourishes. This is what Vatican II is calling us to. Why the universal call to holiness is at the center of um, the, the council. It's not that holiness wasn't always the thing that we should be pursuing and isn't the thing most needful. It's because the stakes are so high now. And modernity is both good and bad. You have great promise in technology and you have great, <coughs> great evil that can come from the misuse of technology. And the call is that we take what's good and we preserve it and we have to resist what's bad. And what's bad, especially with the biotech revolution, you see these, these unimaginable assaults on human dignity that are being carried out now. And if we don't pursue the call to holiness, lots of people die. A lot more die now than ever in the past. So the stakes are a lot higher. That's why the universal call to holiness is at the heart of the Second Vatican Council. Okay, so what does all of this add? What does the body add to thinking? Um, this is a quote from um, a really nice book on theology of the body. God didn't create us in his image as generic human beings, right? Genesis said he created specifically created in his image as male and female. Amazingly enough, in 3,000 years, no one had really grasped the significance of this line. It means that our very embodiment as either male or female, that is our sexual complementarity, reveals something significant about us and thus about God. Okay? It doesn't reveal that God has a body, prescinding from the incarnation, but um, it's gonna reveal something significant. Okay, so what is that? What is sex, meaning here at this point, male and femaleness, what does that reveal? Okay, well, so by the light of faith, sex, sexual complementarity, maleness and femaleness, reveals us something about God as a communion of persons. So maleness and femaleness go together, right? <laughs> Very basic biology. Um, and so that complementarity, if that has to do with being in the image of God, it tells us that there's some kind of communion going on in God. And so we get this idea that the invisible mystery of Trinitarian love, remember cupids and hearts don't sprout up, love is invisible. This invisible mystery of Trinitarian love is imaged or made visible in our bodies when we form a communion of persons in truth and love. Okay, so the body adds something very important. It adds visibility. <laughs> the body makes love visible. Otherwise, it's just an idea. Okay, so love is invisible. Our personality is invisible, right? God is invisible. So God makes bodies to reveal what is invisible. Meaning that then you can, John Paul uses this language, you can call the human body a kind of a sacrament of spiritual reality. Spiritual meaning, you know, knowing, loving stuff you can't see. The body is what reveals that. You see the dignity of the, the human body here. Uh, it's, it's something the world can't even guess at. That the body, the human body, is an icon of personal spiritual reality. That's not what you get when you have uh, Cosmo... Uh, when you have sex in the city, these, this is not what you're getting from the body. The body is just material, <laughs> a desiring machine, as, as Deleuze and Guattari talked about. It's something you wring out pleasure from, but it has no meaning in itself. You see, the dignity isn't there. The dignity is here in the classic understanding of um, body-soul unity. Okay, so you get this idea from John Paul then as the spousal meaning of the body to kind of flesh out this idea of complementarity. So our bodies are made male and female, which is another word for complementarity. They're made for each other. 
Male is made to give of himself to female, and vice versa. And this is still the case even in Massachusetts, even after Goodrich. <laughs> These things don't change by judicial diktat. Uh, this is the example. Uh, two sockets don't go together. This is kind of basic stuff, but uh, our judges don't seem to understand basic biology anymore. So, so okay, you know, <laughs> sockets go. Yeah, right. But so. Spell it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Stop being obscure. <laughs> <laughs> the wonder, one of the wonderful things about human sexuality, and it doesn't appear, it, there's one little thing I can talk about with bonobos, but face to face. Sexual embrace, that's a human novum. It's new for humans. And, and all the evolutionary chain, it doesn't show up. Um, I can talk about bonobos at some point, but that, it doesn't really count there. Uh, and that face-to-face -face sexual encounter is only possible when it's male, female, when it's a, uh, the kind of, the coedal act that is possible of giving life. Otherwise, when we abuse our sexual faculty, it's not face-to-face. And that's, you can see the depersonalization that occurs there. And I, I think it's helpful to think, you know, if, suppose you had, you know, there are organisms in our world that, that are asexual, right? That they reproduce themselves asexually. Well, suppose you had an alien that was asexual and they reproduced themselves asexually. Okay, and he's, he's a literate alien, so he comes to Earth and he's reading a biology <laughs> textbook and he opens a page to the male reproductive system. And he's like, this is so strange. You know, like, what in the world is this for, you know? And well, he has to turn the page and look at the female reproductive system, and then it makes sense, right? But on its own, it's really odd. And that's the most basic level of, of complementarity, that the two make sense only together. So our bodies, to raise it from the level of biology textbooks, our bodies are testifying to the fact that we are made for self-gifts. So John Paul says, you know, even our very bodies tell us that. That we're not complete in ourselves. So that, that point about er that Aristotle makes, we only flourish as human beings in relation with each other. So, why doesn't it work all the time? You know, it sounds great, self-give, you know, that's not, if you tell somebody, you know, what is your body for? Again, you might get that list that you get at the beginning, but self-gift might not be at the top. <laughs> and so, and this is a, a criticism that's been leveled against John Paul, that it's like, oh, this is all very lovely, it's very romantic, but it's really out of reach. Right, because that's not our experience. Um, so all about Eve, actually all about Adam. Um, with the fall, right, apple, so back to Genesis. <laughs> actually, it's not an apple, it's a fruit. Um, but with, when, <laughs> when that fruit was taken from the tree and eaten. <laughs> with, back, let's go back to sockets. <laughs>
from this new dignity through the redemption of the body, which is a, taken from Paul, a new obligation was born at the same time, about which Paul writes in a concise but very moving way, you are bought at a great price. Okay, so we have this new life in Christ. He's given us a new way to live. He's made that possible. But if there comes a certain obligation, a certain um, pattern of living that becomes necessary. And what is that? All right, so there's two basic vocations that we have. We have marriage, and we have various forms of celibacy, being called to the priesthood or to the religious life. And it's important to think, because a lot of people think, well, you know, if, if the Pope's talking about the spousal meaning of the body, that means he's really denigrating the celibate vocation, or he's kind of, you know, being super romantic about sex and all of this. But in fact, as we're going to see, the, the life of celibacy doesn't denigrate the spousal meaning of the body. It, in fact, heightens it. Let's see how that's going to be. All right, so when the Pope talks about celibacy, he talks about continence for the kingdom, which he didn't make up. He actually gets this from... Um, the gospel, where Christ talks about um, this kind of vocation. So in other words, it's not celibacy for its own sake, which would be kind of dumb, right? <laughs> but for the kingdom, it's a, a celibacy for something, for participation in Christ's virginity. So what is a continent person choosing? First of all, there's a negative choice. He's saying no to something, or she, right? And, and it's more important to see you can tell a person how far along they are in a, a certain level of spiritual maturity when you ask what's being given up in celibacy. Yes, sexual relations, but the thing that's being given up is that sharing of a whole life that constitutes marriage and family. Um, it's the consolation of having children around you, the spousal support. That's, that's the thing that you're giving up, and it is a very great, great sacrifice indeed. So the Pope doesn't minimize that at all. You know, and, and he emphasizes, of course, that celibacy isn't a denigration. It's not saying sex is dirty. It's not saying marriage is a lesser vocation. Well, not saying marriage is bad. Um, what he's saying, what it's saying is, this is so great, I'm willing to sacrifice it. I'm willing to, to offer it up. But it's also a positive choice. It's not just saying no, 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 no. You know, neither should chastity just be saying no, 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 right? That's not a comfortable way to live. It's a positive choice for something to love and cleave to the bridegroom. And these are words taken pretty much from, from John Paul. Or especially for the priest, um, to cleave to uh, the bride, the church. Um, certainly, uh, for a religious woman, it's, it's very easy to, to think of the marriage, and indeed they often wear wedding rings because of their spousal to uh, the Lord. Uh, you give up something great, and that's the measure of one's love. You see this even when, you, when you're raising kids. Obviously, it isn't, if you want just comfort, comfort in life, just the kind of base level of comfort, there's a reason why Europe is dying, right? It's because comfort is being chosen over something that is kind of hard, raising children. But I tell you, there's nothing greater. No satisfaction. Now, see, a priest will, will have experience of something higher in the consecration on, on the, the altar. But for me, and this is what I was made for, there's nothing like having kids. And it's partly because it, it's, it is, at, certain, at some points, very hard. That's part, it's intrinsic to the beauty of the thing. Because love wants to give. It wants to sacrifice for the one who's loved. And so that's why, you know, celibacy really has to be love for a person. You know, whether it's the church or Christ. I mean, it has to be that personal kind of um, and this is a quote from John Paul. So condense for the kingdom is an act of a spousal gift of self with the end of answering in a particular way the Redeemer's, in other words, Christ's spousal love. A gift of self understood as a renunciation, but realized above all out of love. Okay? And so this is how the consecrated celibates live out the spousal meaning of their bodies because they actually are testifying to this spousal love that Christ offers them in the way that they live. So it's not denying the spousal meaning of the body, it's actually a very high fulfillment See, of it. If it weren't the case that, that, that there was this natural union that's written into our bodies, then when uh, a religious or a priest gives up the fruition of that in family life, it wouldn't matter because it wasn't there in the first place, right? But it's because it is here that this in fact is a higher thing to give this natural dynamism, the, the, the natural 
uh, accomplishment of this inclination in us for a supernatural realization of it, and indeed one that all of us will participate in, in that infinite intimacy of heaven, where in fact, the intimacy is so great, sex will be superfluous. So. This all, he, he ties a lot of this together by talking about the language of the body, which we have a kind of in a very secular way of doing it. We talk about body language, it's a similar sort of thing. The idea being that we have to tell the truth with our bodies. Remember, our bodies reveal what's invisible. Okay, so our bodies are speaking all the time. And our actions speak. And some of our actions have a meaning that even if our heads want the meaning to be different, the action is still there. You know? Um, let somebody like, give the example. You know, if I go like this, we know what that action means. Even if I'm like, no, I love myself, really. <laughs> you know? I mean, my action means something, and everybody can read it in a certain way. So what does sex say? Now moving on to this, the sexual act. Sex says, objectively, I love you forever. I want to be with you forever. I want to have children with you. I'll never leave you. That's what sex says as an action. Now, of course, it gets very complicated here because um, that's, the, that's the mating act, the cuidal embrace, the, uh, the, the sockets <laughs> lined up right. Um, what we have, of course, with the sexual revolution of the 90s and, and obviously this touches a lot of people in this room, um, is, and this is why it's such a grave assault on human dignity, and it just pulls people in. It's not a matter of blame. blame. But when sex is taken out of, sexual pleasure is taken out of that uh, coedal embrace, um, it's, it's not even saying any of these things anymore. It's, uh, it's just pleasure, and indeed, it's what, the way we raise, and as a father of two girls, it, me nuts, this Planned Parenthood way of looking at the world where we, we basically pimp out our daughters. We say, look, you grow up and you find your liberation in servicing ma deformed male sexual desire. And that, you have it in spades with the thing we got in the 90s, um, the epidemic of oral sex and so on. So we're, we're two removes here from the, uh, the way we lie with our bodies. We miss you sex. So there's an analogy you could think about. You can think about food, okay? Because we don't want to say sex is not about pleasure. I mean, God created it for crying out loud. So it's not like God's surprised. Oh, you find sex pleasurable? <laughs> but God, you know. Oh wait, I created it, right? I mean, God made sex that way, right? So the thing about food, it's very similar. You know, if we pick, you know, our tasty pizza bagel out there, you know, we're expecting pleasure from it, of course. That's why you might pick you know, the pepperoni one instead of the plain cheese one, right? But it's also for nourishment. And we, we expect that. The two are supposed to go hand in hand. Okay, now Alestra, right? The fake fat. If you read the, the labels, it'll basically say, you know, there's no nutrient value in this food. I don't even know if Alestra's still in the market. But anyway, it used to be. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people bought it, which is good. Um, it's, was, the idea is it's all pleasure and no nourishment, right? So you buy your potato chips. It moves literally right through your body. You don't get any nourish from it, nourishment from it, but oh, you get the pleasure of eating potato chips, which is odd, right? I mean, anybody who knows anything about food knows that no, that's not how food is supposed to operate. And if you try to live your whole life on a lestra, you would wind up in the hospital, right? That's not how food works. Well, sex is very similar, right? Sex is supposed to have pleasure, but it's also supposed to be about bringing new life into the world. And this is Aquinas says this, right? The reason we have such primal urges for food and for sex, well, the one, you get pleasure from eating because you need it to survive, and God wants us to survive. And you get pleasure from the other for the preservation of the species, and God wants lots of people. One of my, one of my moral pro, uh, theology professors used to say, if sex were like calculus, the species would have died out a long time ago. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a mistake that sex is enjoyable. However, it's not, you're not supposed to just pull the pleasure out and leave everything else aside. And so the question becomes, are we engaging as a culture, do we engage in fake sex, the way we have sort of fake fat and fake food? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit just quickly about cohabitation as part of this phenomenon, because it's a real um, issue. Um, so there's this question, you know, maybe, you know, we should just live together. And it's a prudent thing to do, right? You wouldn't buy a used car without taking it for a test drive, right? 
Why don't you take your test analogy. drive? Um, there's you this, hear it, right? this great article by, by Jennifer Robat Morse where she talks about this and points out the obvious. Here's the problem with the car analogy. The car doesn't have hurt feelings if the driver dumps it back in the used car lot and decides not to buy it. The analogy works great if you picture yourself as the driver. It stinks if you picture yourself as the car. And, and let's not be deceived who the driver usually is. I mean, there is there's a matter of male and female power here. Driver, who's in the driver's seat? It's almost always the man. And so, really, I mean, what you get with cohabiting is this idea: cohabiting will prepare you for marriage. And it's a very, you know, I mean, we have so many people who have been deeply wounded by the problem of divorce, and people want to avoid divorce. You know, and so they think if I cohabit, this will keep me from divorcing later on. But the problem is that it doesn't work that way. Um, fewer than half of cohabiting couples will marry eventually. And if they do marry, they're nearly 50 times more likely to divorce than people who did not cohabit. 50 percent, excuse me. And women and children are a lot, there's a lot, the violence level in cohabiting households is astronomically higher than in married households. It's especially dangerous. It's the most dangerous place for children, actually, to be in a um, cohabiting household with their non-biological father. Um, why? Think about it. Why would cohabiting be so unlikely to prepare you for marriage? Because you're not, pra you can't practice commitment by not being committed. That's what it comes down to. Cohabiting is a habit of not trusting the other person. So when you have one foot out the door all the time, you're not teaching yourself how to commit, you're teaching yourself how not to commit. And that doesn't make help for healthy marriages later on. So um, the benefits of marriage, however, so if you think about the fact that God made us in the garden to be joined, male and female, to, that God made marriage, it makes sense that marriage is actually good for us as human beings. But a lot of people don't realize that there's actually been lots of sociological analysis on the fact that it is good for us in comparison to other arrangements like cohabitation. Married couples are happier, healthier, wealthier, and have more and better sex. I didn't make this up. You can read the statistics. Um, and here's a book that compiles a lot of them. 40% of married people rate their lives as very happy. And if you include just happy, then it's like into the well over that, compared to less than 25% of cohabitors. Um, it's, it's a proven fact that men make more money after they marry. It has something to do with the fact that they have to kind of, you know, Give up habits that single men tend to have. I apologize to all the single men if you don't have those habits. But married men tend to drink less, smoke less. They tend to sleep more. <laughs> you know, they just have healthier habits, and this leads to a general flourishing in their in their life. It's it's evidence of the reality of human nature, as opposed to this kind of nominalist myth that we just call something human nature, and it's it's a fiction. It's so real that in fact, if if the science is being done honestly, you're going to be able to gauge certain things about human flourishing if, it's, if you act in a way in accord with the way your nature was designed by God. Okay, so uh, kind of summarizing then what marriage is all about, what sex is all about. This is a really, there's a great pamphlet out there, you can Google it, um, by the Australian Bishop Conference. And they say, we should say what we mean and mean what we say with sex. And sex says marriage. Even again, even if our minds are thinking something else, our bodies are saying marriage. Sexual intercourse is the body language which accompanies and expresses again and again the wedding vows. It is the language of total gift. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about marriage. It's, marriage is a funky sacrament because you know, marriage really has two levels of reality. Baptism doesn't really have that. You know, it's, marriage is really special. Marriage is a natural reality, and this is why the Massachusetts bishops can get on television and say, you know, marriage is something. <laughs> it is the union of a man and a woman oriented towards new life. They're not talking about Catholic marriage. They're not talking about Christian marriage. They're talking about marriage. This is what marriage is. It is naturally lifelong and life-giving, and you don't have to be a Christian to know. But, as Christians, it also has a supernatural reality. It is a reflection of Christ's marriage to the church as his bride and body. And so we, as Christians in a sacramental marriage, are called to be faithful and fruitful the way God is faithful and fruitful. And sacramental marriage, you know, all those fears that people have about, you know, I can't do it, how can I be with somebody, you know, for my whole life, you know, the church says, you don't have to do it. Let Jesus do it. Give, you know, avail yourself of the grace of the sacrament, of marriage, of Eucharist, of reconciliation, 
And that, you know, that's what it's there for, to help you do it. This is a general point about the Christian moral life. You read the Sermon on the Mount and how uh, Jesus ups the ante on everything. It says that uh, you can't, not only is murder wrong, you can't hate in your heart, right? Uh, and you look at it and you think, uh, how am I supposed to do that? Well, he says it knowing what he's going to do on the cross and the blood and water flowing from his side, which are the sacraments of the church, by this, this thing that he's going to make possible because of his total self-sacrificing love, he knows that you will have the power because he's going to give it to you to come to a happiness, not only a, uh, to fulfill human flourishing, but indeed to reach to a happiness we could not have dreamed of in the Trinitarian life. So um, I, we find that Catholics need to be catechized in both aspects of marriage, including the, the natural reality, even, even that naturally it's good for you. you know, when, we can tend to think like marriage is this, you know, we'll, we'll enter into it, it's gonna be really hard, it's gonna, you know, we're gonna endure it, you know. It's actually, we know it makes people happier, and we sh it shouldn't be a surprise. Um, so, marriage and family then. This, the reason that this is so tied, it's so important for us as lay people to understand is that this is really at the heart of what it means to be a, a lay Christian. Um, we have to get marriage and family right. So remember, remember at the very beginning, those two prongs of the new evangelization entrusted to the laity, it's Catholic social justice, theology of the body. So you have to ask the question, is marriage my vocation? Is it the way God has given me to transform the world? This, it's a serious question. It's as serious as anything. God truly has for each and every one of you a unique vocation. It's going to be in one of the states of life, either lay, uh, clerical, priestly, or religious. But in, in, within that, it's going to have the specific contours that take into account the personality God has given you. We need to ask, and I need to ask you, young men, are you called to priesthood? You're not going to be happy if, the, if that's your call and you don't answer the call. Young women and young men, are you called to religious life? But for most of us, that concrete call involves marriage. How we are meant to get to heaven, how we are meant to bring God's love into the world is through married, married life. And again, if we try to seek our happiness outside of the concrete state of life, the concrete way God has, has, knows will make us happy, it's like wanting to be a whale or something like that. It's that, continent, it's that much out of sync with reality. If you're called to married life and you, and you miss it, I, I'm going to cling to bachelorhood. You're going to miss happiness. It's a very tragic thing. So what we have to ask for most people indeed, and it's something we've just lost the sense of, is marriage your vocation? If it is, this is how God wants you to change the world. And you can see it. In family life, societies live and die. Either education and the, all the, the civilizational achievements, uh, spiritual principles of the church, uh, this all happens in the family. And it, when those are... When the family starts to fall apart, you cannot have a society. Your nation will fall apart. Um, and everything's at stake. The common good is at stake in married life. So, sex, that's going to the heart of the common good. Um, it's not just, you know, that justice is something you do in Honduras or something. <laughs> it can be, but it's... You but, can, but, <laughs> We want but justice in Honduras. This, there is a tendency, <laughs> maybe at certain universities, to think that to be an active layperson means to go out. Social justice starts at home. It starts here in my heart. It starts here in the dorm rooms. It's not as easy as saying, I'm going to go on a work trip. We don't settle the accounts of social justice then. So one thing that John Paul II brought to mind as far as the most important part of social justice is the new feminism. So the fact that women and children in a culture of death have it pretty bad off. <laughs> and this is something that it becomes part of um, achieving social justice, <laughs> as do, doing pro-life work to help women and children um, who are really victimized by the kind of depersonalized sex that's presented to us as the norm. Now, I want to make a point here. It's, it's clear that the victims are, are women and children, but obviously everybody is damaged, men too. And I'm a, I'm a father of a, a young, of a boy whom I want to be a great man, but he, the world is telling him, look, 
you exploit women, this is the way to go. There's nothing that could corrupt his, and make impossible his pursuit of happiness than if he were to buy this lot. So, I mean, so it's, it's everybody, everybody who's um, at stake here. And so one thing that we're facing is to say, you know, we have to rescue this understanding that marriage is just my individualistic choice. I can make it to be whatever I want it to be. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an intrinsic part of how most of us are called to be happy. So, um, well, one thing my husband and I... Yeah, I'm always on the common good here. Uh, <laughs> Anytime it's the common good, because it's probably a bullet that he added to my original slides. <laughs> like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> this, it's very important because it, there's a certain persuasion in, in the church, and we know this, right, that, that's claimed the mantle of social justice. <coughs> Like, for instance, you have a split between peace and justice Catholics and pro-life Catholics. This is very, very bad, very bad. You want to be serious about social justice, you have to be pro-life first. And, and we shouldn't be shy about using the word social justice. Um, because, indeed, it is very important. Uh, whatever a cohabiting couple is doing, or any person who's using sexual pleasure outside of, of marriage, you know, and it, all kinds of reasons. And again, it's not a matter of laying blame. That's, that's not what Christian morality is about, what Christian exhortation is about. It's about making sure people come to the happiness that God wants you to have. It really, I mean, that's, there's a, should be a crucifix there. Oh, there, good, crucifix. That's what it's about. God loves us to the end. He dies, he dies, God dies because he wants us to be happy. And that's what Christian morality is about. It's not a matter of this arbitrary ruler saying, do this. That's, that's such a perversion of what it means to, uh, to live the moral life. Uh, but whatever a person is doing who's misusing sex, and there are all kinds of reasons to fall into that, and it's touched most of us, you're not thinking about the common good when you do it. I guarantee you. You're not thinking, how's this affecting the common good? Because sex, in fact, has this intrinsic orientation to the common good. At stake is new life. We're going to give an advertisement running for the Massachusetts Catholic Conference. Um, and let me see if I have a website. Yeah. Um, we urge you to go there, take a survey and stuff. We're going to be developing materials. We're going to have things like audiovisual materials, um, fact sheets, you know, bulletin inserts, that sort of thing. There's a survey on there now that you can take. There'll be PowerPoint presentations. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a really important thing right now to try to help people understand <coughs> what marriage is all about, both as a natural reality and as a we encourage you to, to go to that and um, keep an eye on the website as things, things pull out. Um, but we, we want to kind of wrap this up by, by focusing on the, what does it mean to live out the theology of the body? A lot of people find the theology of the body unbearably abstract <laughs> and, and German, even the, the Pope is Polish. Um, <laughs> what does it mean to live out the theology of the body? Right? My German <laughs> father finds it unbearably German. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's what we say. In-laws, not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, and the most basic message behind the theology of the body is we cannot be happy unless we practice and live out selflessness and self-gift. I didn't edit Selfless. this very well. <laughs> <laughs> All typographical errors are almost certainly mine. Um, we're called to love fruitfully. Love is supposed to be fruitful. He has a whole big section of the theology of the body and command and vitae, which we only basically alluded to in this talk. Um, we have to be happy to talk about it more. But love is not supposed to be sterile. <laughs> All love is supposed to bear fruit. That's how God loves. God loves the us. The question is, do we think sex has the dignity of love or not? Is it recreation or is it love? And for most of us, we still have those dreams, and especially young ladies, but in which I guess is a measure of how much we can we've attacked each voice I think. But you want to marry uh, the prince in shining armor. It's something that's getting, you know, the master's frameworks, all these sex ed, this is to squash this dream out of every young girl's heart. But it is, that's, a, that's child abuse, by the way, and that is a violence. It, anyway. Um, <laughs> Back to life. I can get on that. <laughs> <laughs> we know at the deepest level, because it's, it's the, one of those fundamental natural law inclinations that this is, sex is about love. Discern your vocation. You know, how, how is it we're called to love fruitfully? Priests love fruitfully. They don't bear physical fruit, 
right? God willing. They, there's a fruitfulness, a spiritual fruitfulness, right? You know, they are bearing fruit. They are consecrating, this, they're confecting the Eucharist, right? It bears huge spiritual fruit. They're, they're, you know, bringing new children into the church, and, and so that's what. And they're spiritual fathers, and it's very important for men to understand. There's, there's headship. We talk about that. It's true. Uh, spiritual fatherhood, which which doesn't make any sense unless you understand the place of the father in the, in the family too, but. The priest gives a family life so that he may be the father of all in his care. Which, of course, by the way, is why it is such a heinous crime to engage in um, sex abuse. And spiritual incest, it's, it's very grave indeed. Um, chastity, right? The freedom to love is chastity. Um, pornography <laughs> is a grave, grave problem. Um, it is not, you know, it's, again, we can't, have a dualism between our souls and our bodies. We can't think, oh, I can do this and I'll still be able to live, you know, faithfully and fruitfully with a wife, you know, down the road. It's a very dangerous thing. Still, it's not a matter of, of making people feel bad. Um, we, you know the statistics. You know some of you in this room will be caught in this or have been caught in it. I don't have to convince you that this is destructive of your happiness. Any addiction is. The point isn't to say, oh, you shouldn't have become addicted to alcohol, to, to pornography. A Christian who's doing uh, what a Christian ought to be doing is, I'm going to reach down and help you because I love you, and I know that this is, this is hurting you very deeply. It's very easy to fall into pornography because, of course, with the Internet, you don't have the controls that social shame put in place. It's very easy to fall into this. It's quite understandable. Nevertheless, it's hurting you. Really. <laughs> not now, not later. It just, I mean, if you want to be happily married, you know, the odds are that this will hurt your, your, your odds. And if you are called to marry in the future, most people in this room, um, live lifelong, life-giving love. Um, natural family planning, which certainly can be happy to talk about. In other words, total self-gift. That's what you vow on the altar. I'm willing to love totally. Doesn't mean I think I'm able to, but I'm willing to try, and I know Jesus will give me the grace to do it. Is that it? Yes. Well, that should lead right into questions. Yes, lots of questions. <laughs> yes, good. Yes, that would you can tell we're not shy. what the professor is trying to get at there? Was there an agenda or is it just? I don't, I don't know. Okay. I think, was it perspectives? No, it was history. Oh, okay. Well, I so know you're reading Freud and perspectives. perspectives uh -huh. It's the same but thing. It's still true. I mean, there is, true, there is a true, truth there. Right? There is a truth there. But it's not as if, even with more arranged settings in the past, that that meant there wasn't any love in the homes. Mm -hmm. That love, the romantic love didn't necessarily Evolve. lead to it. Yeah. Doesn't mean love wasn't there. <laughs> Um, but yes, yes, there is a change that now romantic love, and, and I think rightly it is more congruent with human dignity to have uh, the ones who are going to be in marriage to, to choose it. But all the more, we shouldn't compromise what true love ought to be about. And that it, it means we don't live in a way that uh, when we marry, we actually mean it for life. Then what are we saying about romantic love? If we're saying, well, those bad old days of arranged marriages, uh, well, if the women weren't being left behind and, and the man was, uh, so the man can move on to a younger woman, I don't know. You have a social justice argument there, but you don't need to have either or. You can say, look, love well now. And uh, thank God we can have romantic love in the beginning. And courtship, ah, but we don't make use of courtship now. But it's a good point. I mean, there is a difference now. Yes. There's a guy, David Blankenhorn, and he contests that history and gives a lot of good kind of archaeological 
sociological arguments as to why he wrote the, the Future of Marriage is one of his books. Um, and so it's not, it tends to be something that is a sort of scholarly cliche, but if you kind of dig down deeper, there's a lot of people who disagree that, you know, back then it was procreation and right now it's love and it's just kind of too simplistic of a, of a framework. I mean, but there's, there's lots of evidence that husband and wife love each other, you know. But, but procreation is still the most basic thing at stake. It, it, if you know evolutionary biology, you know this is the case. Sex was developed for procreation, for reproduction, and now when we get to, to humans, procreation. That's evolution. Um, traditionally, there was any two ways to apply this, through the ends of marriage, um, procreation and mutual health of the spouses and um, remedy. remedy yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, Maybe since Vatican II, so maybe since the catechism was put out, there's only, <coughs> only list two ends of marriage, which are procreation and I think it's the good of the spouses. That's right. Um, so <coughs> how are those, are, did, did we lose one there? And, and, or, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and what, what exactly does uh, Remedium Contrificentia mean? Uh, I don't think it's too hard for us to understand that. but. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a very realistic thing that it's better to, oh, St. Paul says it right, it's better to marry than to burn. I, you know, I think we all we have a sense of what that means. Um, the church doesn't list it now, that's, that's true. Um, could, could I add yes. something? Yes. Well, the, and you alluded to it in your presentation too. I think part of it, I mean, I don't know whether there was formal decision to drop one of them or not, but I mean, there might be a realization there that really sin does come from the soul. And when we use language like a remedy for concupiscence, we tend to think of our, it's an implicit view of the body as something <coughs> sort of out of control, and we have to do something so that it won't, you know, sin. When in fact, I mean, concupiscence, or more specifically lust, I mean, it starts in the soul. I mean, it's a disorder that starts there. And it has its visible manifestation in lustful acts. But it's not relegated to the body as if the body is something different. Thank you, Anthony. That's, that's very clear. I think that's right. Um, that's a very profound issue. Uh, in a way, you could see that whatever is true there, and you, you're right to say we have to sort that out a little more, it's enfolded into the good of the spouses, probably, right? That it, it is a matter of that, um, there is a strong urge associated with sex. God puts it there for the sake of uh, procreation. And that urge can be disordered, and that's what the concupiscence is for. But as it's in its truth, it's one of the basic natural law inclinations, and that's part of, um, being able to uh, satisfy that urge is part of what spouses do for each other. So, but if I, I mean, the, the urge is different than the concupiscence. Right? The concupiscence is a disorder. Exactly right. So, and, and I, I mean, I, to be honest, I, can't, I I'm not an issue. I don't understand the quote from Paul. And it seems like you're saying, well, you can't control your urges. Well, get married, and then it won't be a problem. Um, whereas, it, whereas, uh, whereas the person should learn, should learn that, um, or, or should, should seek that, you know, discipline before they, before they enter marriage. So it's not, so it's not a, a band-aid for concubiscence. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, okay, that's very important, and I, this, that's what Anthony is, was, was pointing to, that um, we can't understand Paul as saying, and that's right, I should have done this live and citing him. You have to understand that what he's saying is that uh, if it's your vocation to marry, then the place for that uh, urge is in marriage, and you can't have it realized any other way. You can't be happy. It can't work itself out. Chastity has to be realized in a concrete state of life, either celibate, either celibate or married. Uh, and I don't want to give the impression, as you often heard with, with the sex abuse scandal, well, if you just let the priest marry, then that will take care of it, as if the wife were just to be a dumping ground for the sex. And that's, that, that's obviously a perversion of um, it. That would not be the right way to read Paul, so I, I think that you're uh, pushing that. That is, 
you have to understand it's better to marry than to burn is that this is granted that this is your vocation is to be married and that that's where that urge ought to be otherwise the urge should be uh, the chastity will be in a celibate chastity but in any case it has to be uh, the urge has to be formed by virtue we're going to name our children Yes. You were mentioning you were listening states of life, um, and you listed priesthood and religious life and married, um, and you only mentioned married under under laity, and I'm sure you mentioned men and singles, but you forgot to. So I was wondering if you might just reformulate the list of working in the single the single life. Did I say married? I'm sorry. The third state of life is the lay state of life. No, no. I'm sure you 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 mapped it unfairly, but at any point you just never mentioned the single lay life. it is very important to acknowledge that God has called some people to single, uh, lay singlehood. Uh, I think it's important that, and especially since marriage is delayed now so much for people, that even if you're not ultimately going to be single, that in fact a lot of us spend a long time in this, a lot of fertile years in the single state. And I think in general, either for that temporary state or just for uh, single life in general in the lay state, that it would be helpful to have more formal uh, ways of integrating that into the church's life, some kind of vow um, that isn't religious. So there, there are these secular institutes that try to, to bridge this. Um, I, it's not, I'm not saying that one has to do that to live a lay single life, but uh, it always helps to be in a role that the church understands publicly. So, because it's hard for us to make our ways in the world with a private the Vitkin sitting argument, you, it, it, you can't have a private social role. It's very good. I, I don't want that. It's very important because there's a lot, a lot of lay uh, people who are single who, who feel left out, and, and it's, uh, I definitely don't want to do that. It's, it's very important to recognize that God has a plan for that, for that, the fruitfulness that that singleness makes possible for the, in the lay state. Since the ultimate foundation for the whole theology of the body is the Trinity, God has helped give love, uh, are you aware of any religious Jews or Muslims that embrace the theology of the body without the Trinity? <laughs> oh, wow, that's, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Because now think of Martin Buber and I am now. That's almost Trinitarian Christianity, although he's Jewish. He got his relationship. Yeah. He does push it almost there. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, I think there has to be something there, or else John Paul, in pushing this as putting to the always putting this to the forefront of evangelization, it wouldn't make any sense if it were. You had to have faith to understand it. So. You, the preambles of the Trinity, as it were. That's, that's, thank you. To think about it more. Yes. Did you briefly mention something about worship? Well, <laughs> you can tell me if it's if it's making a comeback. No, just what you mean by that one, for instance, involves the family of the person you are courting in that relationship. See, this is a matter of inserting in, instead of making this a privatistic <coughs> dating as a private game, that in fact, when you are, if you're in love with somebody, their family is kind of intrinsic to the deal, so that you would be presenting yourself to their family regularly. I think you'll find it, it's, it's a good thing to do. Uh, and, and of course, um, <laughs> that it be chased. I mean, that would be one of the things to hear about. <laughs> As you said, if if you know the act of sex is the final, you know, if it says saying married, I want to be married. Um, is it possible? 
wanted to go the other way, like in a courtship, that, you know, I don't want any physical kind of, like if the bodily um, is an expression of how much you, you do mm -hmm. love each other and care for each other. I know that's why the church doesn't give, you know, here's, here's the line. Right. And, right. Um, right. But is it possible to go the other way and say, I don't want to touch, you yeah. know? Uh, here, this would be the flip side of what this uh, questioner's point about our concupiscible appetite, which isn't lustful, it isn't concupiscential. Ap those appetites that desire food, that desire sex. Um, those powers of the soul have to be formed virtuously. And to be chaste would involve not only going on the, obviously, to um, indulge, but also to be to... Um, <clears throat> Rigorous to be rigorous to be locked in that wouldn't be chaste either actually it would be uh, not according to the measure of reason there isn't a I mean, there's some common sense kind of parameters one could go into and, it, and it, those would actually vary according to culture too because there's social expectations here um, but in the end it's going to be a matter of, well not in the end it depends on what we're talking about but prudence is going to be very much involved as it would be with the exercise of many of our virtues we certainly need to exercise of chastity but we have to avoid on the one hand liber Libertinism and rigorism. That's not the Christian moral life is not a matter of being ah, I'm clenched and continent as opposed to chaste. Chaste to be virtuous is to be easy and free in the midst of reality, working, living among the true goods God has made in the right order. So it isn't a matter of being closed in. The Pope is a beautiful reflections on this. He talks about freedom, about chastity as freedom. And he's very realistic. He said that at first it might not feel that way. <laughs> um, it can be really hard as, you, as you're developing a virtue, you know, and you can feel more like it's mostly on the no, no, no side as opposed to kind of like yes to the virtue, yes to the holiness. Um, but the hope is, the, the tra planned trajectory is that you're going to get to the point where it is easy and joyful and freeing, and it feels free. Mortifications could be part of the, that process of virtue. In fact, they have to be. Um, <coughs> Not excessive, but part of the training of virtue, but then it wouldn't be an end in itself. That would be a mistake. I believe us took um, sort of an intense study on theology of the body uh, last semester. And one question that came up during the discussion was the issue of uh, the church's teaching on homosexuality, sort of the, dif the difference between the orientation and the act. And the question sort of surrounded. surrounded um, I'm, if my self-gift as a heterosexual man is towards a, a woman, or if I'm a priest, it doesn't stop me. I'm still a heterosexual man. More, my self-gift is more general towards the going to the church. Whereas someone with a homosexual orientation, I'm not sure how, how do we how do you differenti differentiate between the person and the act because the very direction towards, or the very direction of their love seems to be disordered in that sense. So the act the action of their love is very, you know, how do you draw the line between, between the action and, and the person's love? Okay, I've spent a lot of time studying homosexuality. Um, I do think it has got to be very clear, and this is part of the, what's at stake with the identity politics involved. The insistence on social recognition that this is who I am is precisely to fall for the, the trick that they've already fallen for and it doesn't do them any good. It is to think this is who I am. It's not true. For anybody, the natural law inclination is towards fruitfulness with the other sex, period. That there are overlays, that things can go wrong developmentally, doesn't change that fact. That, in fact, our more conscious desiring um, then has shifted erotic targets because of whatever. There, there, there are lots of places one can trace the contributing factors for this. Um, but it is the key point that God does not make anybody without any human being has human nature. And to, to, to say that they don't have the same inclinations as everybody else doesn't say they're not human. And I'm not going to say that about homosexuals or someone who has same-sex tendencies. That's more precise, actually. I mean, part of it is to say, to use the word, the noun homosexual already kind of substantivizes this tendency, where in fact, you have a person, a human person, created in God's image, who has same-sex tendencies, disordered tendencies. Uh, does the Pope talk about um, the 
complementarity of men and women and their and their difference and, and what that maybe images about God or I don't know, sometimes I, I think about I think about that, but it's hard when um, especially in our day and age to say to make any kind of uh, claim or generalization of that this is um, something that pertains to men as opposed to women or women as opposed to men, especially in terms of personality or or, or uh, you know, behavioral traits. Um, and I'm just wondering also what that what maybe that how that relates to the idea of of a male priesthood. Um, sure. Um. Maybe to start with the last question first, because it'll kind of clarify. Um, it's not like the Pope sits down and really makes a list of things, but he does it, not so much in Theology of the Body, but in some other um, things, like his letter to women talks about things that characterize what he calls the feminine genius. Um, and he talks about things that are, that are oriented around, essentially, I mean, what it boils down to is that women have the ability to be mothers and men have the ability to be fathers. <laughs> and and that those are how the two, the complementarity essentially works itself out. Um, when, so when you when you address the issue of the priesthood being reserved to men, um, for the for the longest time, essentially this was defended in in saying basically this is what Christ did. He appointed apostles, and you know so we have to, to be obedient, and that is the basic baseline. But it, but that doesn't really answer the question why. <laughs> you know it kind of just says this is. Um, and so the question why, there can be any number of possible answers, but the most basic comes down to this idea that the priest is representing Christ, and Christ is married to the church. He is the bridegroom married to the bride. And if the priest is going to represent <coughs> Christ in that role, then that includes representing him as a bridegroom. There's a lot of things that I can do as a woman, but I can't represent a bridegroom, <laughs> right? That just, you know, that, that there's one of those things where maleness and femaleness is built into the definition being bridegroom or bride. Um, so that's um, kind of at that, that most basic level. Um, if you're interested in some of the questions about sexual difference, there are some things that have been done that it's not like the church has, you know, given her, you know, imprimatur on or something, but on the, on the purely scientific level, there's been some, some interesting work that's come out in the past five or ten years on differences between the male and female brain, and, and then you tend to, you're, you're basically talking about tendencies, you're talking about, you know, more women are like this versus more men, but the church has never said, well, a woman has to, you know, do this, she has to wear a skirt, you know, I mean, like, yeah, like it's never that simplistic, and I think that that's, um, makes it more, it's harder for us to get, work our minds around it, but it's also more you know, true to the reality you know, that, that you, find, you find all kinds of different men and women who look you know, you know, all kinds of different ways. Did you want to follow up? Well, yeah, if I could just, mm -hmm. so, uh, what is it, I mean, maybe you can really answer this question, but what is it about the bridegroom, though, as opposed to the bride that makes, that makes them, that, that's imaged by the man as opposed to the woman? And what specific uh, characteristics or, or things about, or about fatherhood, I guess, as opposed to motherhood, that, that's, um, that's the question. Mm -hmm. And it's that the man has the responsibility to put, lay his life on the line for the sake of, for the protection of his wife and family. It doesn't mean that women don't do it all the time. In fact, they do do it all the time. But the man should be the one to do it first. Uh, this is, you can see it in the relative uh, measures as far as uh, muscle mass. Uh, yes, you have some women who are stronger than some men. But there's an intelligibility to the fact that men are stronger statistically than women. There's an, and what's that intelligibility? Well, that the man ought to put his body on the line for the sake of his wife and children. Uh, and it, it actually, that's, that's the basis for the, the headship of the, the father, that because if the man loves the way that Ephesians 5 talks about it, the way Christ <coughs> shows us by laying down his life for his bride, the church, then he has the authority of headship because that's what comes with love. Um, because authority is service. And that's, that's one of the basic points that Jesus makes clear. And then you can go into why authority is necessary, but that's, that's as opposed to the libertarian myth that uh, we just need spontaneous order, 
there is spontaneous order in the market, but that, that's not the only thing that's that's real. If you're going to have, if man is social, you need a, uh, an authority to organize the, the common effort of society. So authority is natural to man, and there's going to be different levels of authority. Because we're social. I mean, either we are, or it's the consumerist, individualistic view that we're atoms that are put together in society by a social contract later is true. I'll say, if you want to defend social justice, we're going to say it's for social. Maybe one more question.